We meet again, and this week we are thinking about forest ecology, or the system of the forest, from the forest floor, where so many plants grow beneath our feet and animals seen and unseen scurry about. To the understory, above the forest floor, but below the tips of the trees. To the forest canopy, where branches touch sky. Let's begin at our vernal pool, the sit spot where we return each week. Hello, Wild Riders. Welcome back to the side of the Vernal Pool, where this week we are thinking about forest ecology and the forest ecosystem and how different parts of the forest work together and live together. We learned on our field trip this week to Sheldrake that the forest is like a town, and within that town, there are different neighborhoods. And within those neighborhoods, there are different smaller homes, just as we have a town. We live in a town, in a neighborhood within that town, and a home within that neighborhood. So we are thinking about the forest this week, and I'd like to begin by reading a poem, the first poem from my first book, which is titled Forest Has a Song. And I wrote this because we do live right near the forest, and I love being out here. And I wrote this poem in the voice, voice of the forest. We talked about how you can write in the voice, not yourself. You can write as an animal, you can write as a plant, you can write as an object, or even a whole forest. And I'll Though a forest cannot write for itself, as a writer, I can pretend that the forest can and that I am the forest, giving it some human qualities. Um, this poem is titled Invitation. The book was published by Clarion in 2013 and illustrated by a woman named Robin Gorley, an artist named Robin Gorley. So I'd like to share this with you to begin our adventure together this week. The poem is called Invitation. Today I heard a pine cone fall. I smell a spicy breeze. I see forest wildly waving rows of friendly trees. I'm here. Come visit, please. And I feel often like nature does want us to visit. And I know that every time I come out to nature, I visit nature, I sit outside on, on the step outside my house, or I look outside the window or open it up to let some fresh air in, or actually sit in the woods or beside a creek. I know that the forest gives something to me. I know that nature changes me a little bit. And, and so this week, we will think about the forest ecosystem together in our nature journals. Our vernal pool neighborhood is full of water, sticks, and decaying leaves. What animals live in here? As I look at the vernal pool here, I'm wondering if I gently move some of these leaves, if I will see a change, you can see the water becomes cloudier. But is there anybody in there? Does any creature have a home who might peek out? Oh no. See the maple leaf there? They decompose. I know there are critters there, but I am clouding up the water. I wrote in my nature journal for a bit, and now that the water has settled, I can see more. I'm going to zoom in here. I can see some really teeny creatures swimming around there. I don't know what they are, but look how fast they are, and look at them go. I might need to look them up when I get back. I'm curious about whether they'll turn into something else or whether they are what they are.
Sometimes nature needs us to wait. Oh, I see new things. Let's talk about what we might write in our nature journals this week as we think about the forest. Hello, fourth and fifth grade wild writers of Mamaronic. It's very good to see you again in Forest Ecology Week. I'm thinking about you and thinking about your forest and thinking about your weather. I did some of my writing inside today because just moments ago, this was falling from the sky. This, it's melting a little bit in my hands now, but it was like a grapple, it's called. It's like a rainy, snowy, haily mix. And it was making such loud noises falling on our roof. So I did some writing inside in my nature journal today. And then I'm going to sit out here and think with you. And then I'll be going back inside to do some research, a little bit of research about a question that I have. So let me show you the work that I did today. One thing I did is I we I rewatched the clip of Jocelyn in the classroom teaching us about forest ecology and also the virtual field trip and I took notes. And this is something we can always do in a nature journal. We can take notes about things that we learn because sometimes just writing something down helps us pay attention to it better. So I'm going to suggest that you try that. Choose one of those or both and take some notes in whatever way you like. I kind of like to take notes all over the page and organize them as I go, but different people have different styles. Let me show you what I did. I'll hold it up and then I'll talk you through it and then I'll show you what I did next. So on this page, I was writing about how we learned about the living things and the non-living things in the forest ecosystem. And the producers, the consumers are the living things, the producers and the consumers, right? Producers are plants that make their own food and consumers are the rest of us who don't make our own food. So, I mean, I can make some spaghetti in the kitchen, but that's not, I need something else to do that, right? That's part plant, part animal if I'm having meatballs on my spaghetti. So I'm thinking about the producers and the consumers as the living things and then the non-living things. And I made a list of each of what I know is in my forest. And I know there's probably more, but I began lists of each. So I have trout lilies are producers. They make their own food, maple trees, moss. I wanted you to see this beautiful moss here behind me. And animals that are consumers, they're herbivores, the ones that only eat plants, the carnivores that eat animals, and omnivores that eat both. That's what I am. Some people are herbivores. Um, I don't think any humans are really carnivores that only eat meat. Mostly um, we're either herbivores or omnivores. So in my forest or in the forests where we live, I know that there are deer, there are herbivores and rabbits and squirrels. And I was kind of thinking about bees. I think they might be too, but I don't really know. Carnivores, I know we have a lot of coyotes here. Great horned owls are carnivores, foxes and ticks. We are pulling ticks sometimes off of the necks of our kitty cats and dogs. And so they are sucking their blood. They are definitely little teeny weeny carnivores. And omnivores that eat both, um, both plant matter and other living things are chipmunks, I think, woodpeckers, raccoons, possums, crows, mice, bears. Sometimes we have bears here, not much, uh, but in the general area. So I think I have these right. And then I'm, then the non-living things that Jocelyn talked about, the weather and the soil and the, the, t the terrain and the wind and rocks and water, all these things that make up the system of the forest or the ecosystem. So when I say the system of a forest or the ecosystem, that's really how all of these things work together. In the same way we learned about how a forest is like a town, right? How Anthony said a forest is like a town. And then within the town, there are different neighborhoods. Like I'm in a little wetlands area of our forest, which is sort of like a neighborhood. And then there's a home within that, which is like your own home. So there's the town, the neighborhood, and the home, just like where we humans live, there's the town of Mamaroneck, right? And then the neighborhood where the roads are, where you live. And then your home, where your house is, your apartment is, your wherever it is that you live, not in a hole in a tree. <laughs> so, so I wrote about that on this page, the producers, consumers, non-living things. This was helpful for me to write it, to remember it. 
And then in my forest, I thought about some different neighborhoods of Vernal Pool, the stream or creek, sections of trees, like little clumps of trees. So I did these notes from just watching that. And then here, I also wrote about the decomposers, of course, and they I needed room. I didn't have it on that page. They are the cleanup crew, the bacteria, the fungi, the earthworms, the insects. When something dies, we don't see so, so many dead things in the forest because the cleanup crew or the decomposers come and take good care of it. So I made some other notes. I talked just a moment ago about that idea of town, neighborhood, and home that Anthony discussed, and I drew that here. I made a little model of the town. And then in a town is a neighborhood, and in a neighborhood is a home. And that helped me think about it. I remember also hearing the words, the door to a house is as small as possible. That's not true in human homes, but in animal homes, of course it is. So that predators or, you know, other carnivores or omnivores aren't coming in to eat up whoever the creature is who made that home. So this was very helpful to me. I did a little bit of sketching. Of course, I'll go back and add color, but these are simply notes from those videos. And I would encourage you to go back and try that. Watch one or both of those videos again and take notes in whatever kind of an artistic way you wish to help you remember these things about the forest, the forest ecosystem. And then when you go visit a forest or you go back to Sheldrake, that forest, you'll have these things in your mind and you'll think, oh, that fits together with this. It's like a big puzzle. So this was the first thing I did. And then I wanted to choose something from here that I'd like to do a little bit more research about. So I thought, hmm, of all these things, what is most interesting to me? And there are a few, actually. I'm pretty interested in different kinds of mushrooms that we find on the forest floor because they, they feel sort of mysterious to me. And I just watched a movie about them. And so I thought about that, but I was truly drawn to the chipmunk because I'm writing poems every day this month for National Poetry Month. And I have a chipmunk who keeps showing up in my poems as a character. And so I'm interested in facts about chipmunks right now. That's just something important to me. So I started a double page chipmunk spread for my research. And so I want you to think about, if you if you want to think about it, but I'm encouraging you to join me in thinking about something in the forest that you might like to research. See, the thing about my nature journal is I can't really draw to life animals that I'm seeing because as soon as they hear me coming, they scurry off. And scientists in the past have sometimes killed animals and mounted them birds so that they can draw them accurately and see them, but I won't be doing that. So I want to look at pictures and do some research about something that I'm really interested in that I might not be able to really ask questions of the chipmunk or sit here and hope a chipmunk's going to crawl up my leg and let me watch it and see what it eats and see what it does. I need to go to somewhere else, so other books or the computer, and I'll share some resources, some places where you can go to do a little research about a forest creature, a plant, an animal, a decomposer that's really interesting to you, or another facet of the forest ecosystem. So here I have the chipmunk. Well, it's a consumer. It does not make its own food. It eats nuts, seeds, berries, and I'm not really sure what else it eats. And I started to draw a sketch of a tree, um, bottom of a tree trunk, and a little arrow I have here that it lives other underground. I'm very curious about the burrows, and I want to draw that here once I do a bit of research. Chipmunks interact with living things, other producers, right? Or producers, it's not a producer. Plants, like oak trees, I think, I think they eat acorns. Sunflowers, I bet they eat the seeds. Berry plants, trees, because I think they climb them, chipmunks. Consumers, I don't know if chipmunks um, interact with um, consumers, other animals besides chipmunks. I, I don't know their relationship. And I, I'm kind of curious if a chipmunk is a, is prey to any animal. I don't know that either. And then chipmunks also interact with non-living things. So they live in the soil. They may have to move rocks when they make burrows, maybe. They drink from creeks. And they're sleeping, they're active based on the weather, I think. So here I listed questions. And I thought about what we talked about before who, where, when, where, what, how, why, and here are some questions that I will research about chipmunks. Do chipmunks eat insects? How big is a chipmunk burrow? Is it called a burrow? How do they survive the winter? Do they remember where they stash their food? Are chipmunks related to squirrels? Do chipmunks live in groups or alone? What do different chipmunk sounds sound like? Or what do they mean? Are there many kinds of chipmunks? How long do moms stay with the kids? Do they live in trees sometimes? And then what I said before, do they have predators? 
So I have room here for my answers. I may need to go on to the next page um, as well. But for now, I have a spot here where I can begin to do some research about a creature, or it could have been a plant, or a decomposer, or any part of the forest that is interesting to me. And I did here make a little spot here that says, it reminds me of, because chipmunks, they remind me of race cars because they have that little stripe down, down the middle of them. So it's interesting and fun in a nature journal to think about facts, right? The questions we have, the facts that we can, can learn through research, either being in the field or reading in some way or asking questions of an expert. And then also a little bit of um, poetic thinking. So you might take whatever it is you are researching and say, what, is else, what else does this remind me of in the world? And compare it to something else. And that is something that writers often do, poets often do, uh, other kinds of creative writers often do. So I am thinking this week about forest ecology, taking notes on what I learned from the Sheldrake naturalists, and I'm going to go back in here and add color. I may even watch one more time to see if there's anything I missed, any other notes that I'd like to be sure that I have here. And as I do this, I will be thinking about the one character in the forest, which character does not have to be an animal. It could be a plant character. It could be moss, could be my character, that I will do a bit more research about. And mine, for now, will be chipmunk. And I will add here what I learned. And I imagine that as I do this research, I will have more questions that I didn't have at the beginning. And also, I will learn things I didn't even wonder at the beginning that may be even more interesting than this. So I wish you a good time in your notebooks, going back, really paying attention to what you learned from the Sheldrake Naturalists, and then saying to yourself, hmm, what here would I like to know more about? And then going on that journey and that exploration to learn more. It was wonderful to see you and I'll see you soon. Take care. Taking notes on interesting talks, such as the Sheldrake field trips, helps us remember what we learn. We can make drawings with our notes if we wish. Everyone takes notes differently. Choose something from the forest, a non-living thing, or a living thing, a producer, consumer, or decomposer. List what you wonder. Then do some research to answer your questions. Write up your research in your nature journal. Be as creative as you like, and remember to include the sources of your information on your nature journal page. Giving credit is important. Here are a few research sites you might wish to check out. National Geographic for Kids, Ranger Rick, Science Kids. We can write on a carpet of crunchy leaves or beside a burbling creek. With our crayons, we can capture the shadows of branches as they fall on our nature journals. as the trees tower over us. We can ask questions. We might notice little things. We can feel textures and know the earth with our hands and our hearts. As you look out of your windows and spend time outside, think about the living and the non-living parts of nature. If you can, visit a forest and think about how all of the living and non-living things work together, just like a town does. We are all part of nature. The forest always invites us to visit and to explore. The forest invites us to write wild.